Can we talk about how crazy it's getting where people feel they, the need to, um, to change what they believe or what they say based on this tremendous polarization of the, of the communities where you can't even just sit down uh, at a table with someone without like there being a kind of complicated, stressful drawing of boundary lines or something like that around the conversation. So, I mean, that's something that's really disappointed me. Uh, that the community has has split, and the, each side kind of writes the other off completely, uh, and I, I don't really support any of that. Um, so that's one thing uh, we, could, we could talk about, but we could just talk about anything. Let's do it. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I don't. I think the polarization takes takes too much of an extreme. I think I think people need to look at the bigger picture. At the same time, it's something we see in societies and and, and politics across the board. Uh, people like to get polarized, and uh, I think I think it's good to remind each other what we're really here for, and uh, that really we have more things in common than not. So we certainly shouldn't be that angry at each other. I think in many cases, and this is really damaging, you know, everyone when we attack each other, and you know. Uh, yeah, well, I think the people do it because there's a there's a reason. Uh, you know, there's the, it does work. Well, as you say, first of all, it's. It's just math, like uh, if, if a bunch of people have a dispute and one side gangs up and forms a big group, then the other side has to, you know, a, a well-organized large group will just crush a series of smaller groups. So you're doomed if you don't team up because teamwork is important. But I think also it's kind of like the... It, it, it kind of it works for people like an easy way to make friends uh, and to show people that you care about them a very cheap way is of showing that you care about other people is to make fun of their enemies especially when the enemies are nowhere around you know nowhere to be seen and so it does work a little bit you know in a strange way you're right this is an inevitable thing it's well documented that whenever there's not if there's an external threat people come together but if you go long enough without a war eventually like it becomes internal again and that is it's kind of depressing to see that happen to bitcoin because i think there were a couple opportunities for better ideas to just solve the problems um but unfortunately we uh we just missed some of those opportunities i think uh, a couple years ago and then once it started to get very bad it's now on a an endless i remember writing in in 2015 about july 2015 about this and I said, it, yeah, it, it started bad, and now it's gotten much, much worse, and it will only get worse as time goes on. And all kinds of people would tell me, like, it can't get any worse than it already is. And that is, like, not even close. It's just continued to get worse and worse and worse. Um, that was way before Mike Hearn quit. It was way before, you know, Roger Veer uh, uh, splintered off with Brian Armstrong and at least before the altcoin ex uh, explosion. So... Uh, yeah, so uh, I don't know how bad it can possibly get, but I definitely, why would it, you know, it won't stop getting bad until either there's some kind of cooperation stimulus or some kind of force or something like that. But these are kind of lofty things. I mean, I guess practical advice for anyone who, who sees this is to just try to keep in mind how wrong everyone is about almost everything that they say I just and do just as human beings and that we're all uh, fallible and that um, you can use each community as a source of of ideas and as of, of criticisms of ideas and that you shouldn't just give up on that because that is a valuable thing and <laughs> you're just giving up on science if you just kind of uh, team up like this. Let's uh, let's let's get into maximalism next. But I think before that, I think so. So polarization does happen, and this is somewhat of a natural occurrence in human societies. But I think if the danger there in, in polarization is is people put on blinders and and get tunnel vision, and you know, like you know, the the demonization and you know all these type of things is you know is not really conductive to finding truth. I think, and you know, what 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 I would 
urge people to do is really try to think for yourself you know have an open mind and and you know look at look at everyone's different views and and see for yourself what what makes sense you know and and you know that that's the part that worries me i think i think you know we we all need to you know really be reminded of the bigger picture and actually you know look at both sides and and also like you know like don't just attack the other side you know try to understand the other side's point of view better you know and then and then learn something from it you know i think that 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 is a greater goal. Uh, there's, a, there's a second thing actually that, in a the in a converse way, one of the worst things is that it actually prevents real criticism from taking place because all the the criticism that takes place is just uh, you know very low effort or sort of low brow, and so it then makes it so that something like you know, I don't think that when like now something like. Uh, I mean, there are, there are a lot of examples, but I think one salient one would be the Lightning Network. Uh, was when it was invented, it was just a really great idea. But now, one side says that it's like this horrible thing that's invading and ruining or doing something question mark, not, kind of not really totally fleshed out. But then on the other side, it's it's held up as this thing that is kind of completely above criticism of any kind, and you don't. You don't. You really don't want anything to be above criticism because that is what happened to the Roman Empire and um, Alan Greenspan and George Lucas when he made uh, the Star Wars Episode One prequel. You know, everyone just thought they were afraid to tell him that these ideas were bad. You know, because he was George Lucas, and uh, it's kind of similar. I mean, uh, in a way, um, yeah. People criticize Blockstream as though it's, it's this horrible place, but then on the other side, it's kind of like they can't do anything they can't do anything wrong at all you know and it's like that is not a recipe for success the criticisms are good so you want not only do you want to not attack people um but you actually want it's it's no good to have a bunch of supporters who are just mindlessly attacking the other side either because they are preventing you from obtaining the knowledge that you need in order to continue the process of improvement so Criticism is also good. Criticism, criticism and optimism are good. You want a lot of those two ingredients. Those are very good ingredients. I think, I think you mentioned uh, scientific thinking, and it's, and it's not science if you don't allow yourself to be disproved in some way. And I think, and I think this is what, we pass, what we're seeing is also it's, it's a lot of uh, what I would associate with cult-like behavior in that people... Yeah, people people group together, uh, you know, uh, the self-righteousness, the demonization of the other side. You know, I mean, this in many ways is very damaging, and, and we can all afford to have a much more open mind. I think the reason we're talking, we're kind of spending a lot of time on this, and I don't know, we have, a, like, no schedule, and nothing is planned, this is all just whatever. But I think, you know, this is a very deep mistake. You know, if there's some bug in code or something, it can be fixed, and so any number of people could fix it. But this is a, something that is very, it shuts off the pathway to correction for both communities, and it just stays off, like, maybe forever, in the worst case scenario, because something else would happen that would be better, a uh, better idea than uh, Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, and I don't know what form that could take, but you know, it's definitely not impossible. You know, it's, it's definitely it's definitely a possibility that something, you know, something using a totally different strategy like uh, Ripple could make inroads with something. And I don't I don't really believe that that is likely to happen. But the point is, if if a, an idea stays stays static for long enough, eventually some some improvements will be made. And if they can't find, make any progress in either of the two communities, then eventually, you know, it's only a matter. You know, you cannot. You cannot sustain a static um, piece of technology for a very long time. So let's let's talk about that. You're you're famously known as a Bitcoin maximalist, and uh, you know my my counterpoint to that is I really I, th I think the most free you know we can be in such system is having a plurality of choice, and I think that that different people are going to make different choices based on their own ideology. And and I think that's that's really a positive thing that that allows us to have a free market of currencies and and in many ways that's something we we should aspire to to you know have confidence in in the systems we believe in and 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 you know believe that they can compete. I think I think that's incredibly important. Yes. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, I think I, I did write on my blog, which is truthcoin.info, I wrote an essay called Bitcoin Post Maximalism, which is kind of an update, sort of like a, where I kind of say, like, where did it, because it's still mostly believe it, but I sort of am saying, like, it's a very nuanced point, so that's why you should probably read the whole thing, but I kind of say, like, is this, is this point really faltering? And, but the, the interesting thing about my version of uh, Bitcoin maximalism is that it was always paired to sidechains, like, very explicitly the whole time, you know, since the idea was proposed in, really in, like, December 2013 or something, and kind of got its steam, and I didn't really kind of understand a lot of it until but it, like the October 2014 uh paper from uh the the blockstream guys that kind of mm, put it made sure that it would be on the map uh, of people's thinking at least in 2014 so my version was always paired with side chains and yeah I'm like a very Hayekian person I'm like super Frederick Hayek and like student of Karl Popper and all that other kind of free experimentation type thing so I completely endorse all of that I just assumed that we'd have this you could make Bitcoin kind of universal and you could let it just transform into other things and it would still be the same 21 million Bitcoins, but they could take any number of, mm -hmm. of trade-offs. And it's surprising to me that that, um, that view has ended up having a very hard time. Uh, many people subscribe to it in private or they come up to me like one-on-one -on -one, or if I'm just talking to them in a loud restaurant, they, uh, they kind of endorse it and, they, and then they'll have some kind of caveat like but we should do it slowly and carefully or something like that it it doesn't really click for people the way it clicks for me is that this should just be number one priority we should have done this as soon as possible i don't know why everyone isn't just working on this especially when scaling debate got big you could have just said well grand compromise while the fees are still low we'll make the second thing and you can just jump ship if you want whenever you want and then um problem would have been solved uh, and so uh, uh, I don't see why it's not uh, priority number one. So a lot of people kind of admit that it's, uh, but there are various people have different hangups, like the fact that side chains have a slightly different, um, slightly different like way of, of working in that uh, normal transactions are examined one by one by this script interpreter, but a side chain transaction has uh, a sort of different thing where it's multiple blocks over a very long time in a, a big sequence uh, that is kind of used to check this. So it's just, I think also that various people were involved with them at, at a certain time or something. So people have all these different, there's like a very long list of like six or seven hangups that people have uh, with side chains. But yeah, that, that totally tempers the Bitcoin maximalism for me. Uh, I, in fact, I found myself fighting, I think, kind of the same thing that you're talking about, where I, I kind of fight the idea, uh, I almost wanted to coin a new phrase for it, which I was thinking like monochainism or something. I was kind of trying to find, what's a good phrase for this? Because I'm strongly against that, and I find that to be not only ridiculous, but uh, it just, it seems like, how could it possibly be the case that, like, everyone doesn't need to agree about everything and that is very unreasonable and it's like people no no nothing has ever worked that way you know like uh, it's like uh, okay the people in well, i don't know about i don't know about the, the eurozone is the best possible example but they, theoretically the people in the the eu would um they would agree on all europe related things <laughs> some people in like you know people around the north sea would agree on like fishing related things for the for that area and then people would agree on anything that affects their country, and then the people in, you know, here in Amsterdam would only have to agree on things that affect the city, and so no one has ever agreed on everything kind of globally with like a few exceptions on like, you know, like property rights or something. So that is kind of, you know, I, I'm against the monochainism, I think it's, but I'm for there just being one system that manages the 21 million Bitcoins, because I think to that extent, Everyone does share a common interest, but yeah, I don't, this is, everyone has kind of gone crazy. And the real rubric hidden beneath all of this is that you can't tell like who has secretly invested in what and to what extent that is just totally coloring their opinions, which is, that is not a, that's an uphill battle to figure any of that out. 
I think um, you know the vision you were describing and, and having having these side chains on Bitcoin and, and that creating that freedom of uh, competition and experimentation. I think in many ways that's that's manifested itself across the cryptocurrency market as a whole. But at the same time, you know, I, I would have loved to have seen your ideas being implemented in Bitcoin, you know, years ago. And 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 maybe that that we haven't seen that happen is. You know, I think that might point towards a failure of, you know, the governance of Bitcoin, which is exactly why, you know, we need multiple choices. You know, I, I wouldn't want... Yeah, and, you know, and I wouldn't want to live in a world where we only have one choice, because that, that does not speak to me of freedom. That, that almost sounds totalitarian to me, actually. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit more. I think it is equal parts irony and um, also a kind of inevitability to it that... Uh, that if we just had this one thing, then other things would not matter as much, and you'd be able to escape uh, the the one piece of software and just use a different piece of software. And if the piece of software that you fled to uh, was terrible, then that would just be on you, and this would be a totally you know internalized, privatized thing. But I think there is a kind of inevitability to it as well, which is that. Well, yeah, I think the timing. You're right. The it, the timing matters. But I think there's a kind of, um, not necessarily in a bad way, but a lot of the people who have been managing the Bitcoin software are like, well, you know, do we really want to just throw it to, you know, because we are feel responsible for this, whatever this thing, you know, they say like whatever, like a, whatever it is, like we feel responsible for this giant multi-million, multi-billion dollar project and we want it to do well and so we don't really want to just, there's a, there's actual, there's, I, I've actually gotten correspondence and even I think a lot of, some of it is, is even public where people have said, well, you know, any side chain that we add should go through like the BIP process and should, um, you, you shouldn't just be able to just, um, kind of unilaterally add one or something like that. And what's weird is that I even agree with that in a, in, a, in some sense, but I don't think it should go through the BIP process. I think it should just go through a very slow, deniable process because uh, I don't, I think it is possible to, this is a kind of a very advanced thing, but I think it is possible for sidechains to sort of interfere with each other. So you could like start up a nation and then quickly declare war on all the countries and then just kind of like shut, steal everyone's Bitcoin and then shut it down or something. But that, I had a different thing for that, which is just to make it kind of slow, uh, which I think is an easier response for that. But yeah, I think there's, a, I feel there's a kind of inevitability to it as well that people just thought, and people just, there's a, you know, I, it's, it's very hard because there are so many factors at play that it's hard to say to what extent which ones are big or which ones caused other ones or something. But, you know, I, I mean, it sounds like I think we, we agree on this. And so, you know, I'm uh, just trying to, uh, you know, get a, a version together that is uh, useful. And, you know, I plan on having a test net very soon. And I have, a, you know, I have actually a, a Bitcoin core version and then I have a different version that just uh, loads the Bitcoin Cash UTXOs. So even though it's, it's, it doesn't really use any Bitcoin Cash code, but it is effectively a Bitcoin Cash version. And I, I'd, I'd like to, um, uh, you know, I hope that people kind of uh, play around with it because I think the idea is very, very easy to misunderstand. Um, I think there's just something about it that it's just kind of new. I think, you know, this is, it, it's, it's kind of an arrogant thing to say, but I think in the same way that Bitcoin was misunderstood uh, very frequently, I mean, all the people in... Big people in crypto really shot down cryptography, shot down Bitcoin because they, they couldn't figure out like how many bits of security it had or something like that. And even then, a lot of people uh, who were into Austrian economics or something, they thought it, in, it didn't follow a regression theorem or some of these other things. So it's kind of like, I don't know, I hate to just, you know, because any new idea could be a terrible idea or a good idea. And I think just... It's easy to misunderstand things, but I think that this idea, when you see the test net, it will uh, it will make it a little easier to understand. And also, I think there's just so much vaporware in the space that if anyone releases anything, people will just be like a little a little more ex disproportionately more excited about it. So, I'm, so I'm excited for that. This idea is sort of coming in test net form, and then I, I hope that more people will try to think about how you know it might solve their problems. 
because I can definitely solve many of mine and a lot of other people's that I, that I know. And so the more people who feel this is helpful, I think the better chance we all have of getting our problems solved. So, um, so let's talk about that because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about side chains. Maybe you can help me understand that as well. The way that I understand it currently is, is if we set up a side chain, uh, it does involve a different trust model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, the security assumptions are the same. Yeah, but then you don't have the same guarantees per se that you would if it was on chain. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not actually sure if I. I think the uh, the assumption, either the premises and the the assumptions and like the axioms, I think are basically the same. And I think the 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 guarantees are really the same. It's just there's something in the middle is is a little different. So, the way I have this set up is that the it's very asymmetric, so there's one chain that's in charge of everything, and then there are all these optional side chains that are kind of like, more like a plugins or something. But since it's, it's a devoutly asymmetric situation, so if you had a large block si side chain, for example, if you ran a full node of that, you'd have to also run a full node of Bitcoin. You'd, you'd have them together. And so whenever you make a transaction from the, side, from the original main chain into the side chain, the large block in this example, um, the large blockchain would, would be aware of it immediately because as far as it's concerned, this is just one big node that has two pieces. So that transactions go in are instant, but then transactions coming out are uh, instant and you know, perfectly successful and perfectly uh, just as secure as regular transactions. And then once you're in there, of course, there's this possibility of these atomic swaps that are, uh, that are also instant and that have been kind of around for a while, but haven't really taken, or you, or you could use something like Shapeshift or something. So that's just, side chains are very similar to altcoins in that you are using a completely different piece of software that doesn't necessarily need to have any effect on the, the base software that you're running. So they're, they're totally distinct, yes. Right, so but it, it's because it's so distinct, it is, um, like I was saying, a, a different trust model in that sense. And, and, and it's because you don't have a full proof of work network, you know, guaranteeing the security and the incentives of that system. You need to construct a different set of incentives. And, you know, these might be better or worse, but I, I suppose my point is that they are different. Yes, so uh, I was just gonna, everything is basically the same except when you take money back. And that is the interesting aspect, which is that if you want to take money, which you must be able to do in order for this to kind of really um, not have too much, uh, you know, just in order for this to really be useful, they have to be as good as regular Bitcoin, uh, at least in a overwhelming sense. So the, yes, so the, um, sorry, the, uh, when the money is coming back, it is allowed to go anywhere. And that is what enables the sidechain to be ignorable. And so you need the sidechain to be ignorable, otherwise this all regresses to the same fight it's always been over everyone agreeing on everything. So it just regresses to the monochainism point. Uh, and since it's allowed to be anything, it's allowed also to just be the wrong owners or just the miners just taking it for themselves or something like that. And so that is the, really the first hang-up. People have one of two hang-ups. They say either it's, they think it's required, which it's not, <clears throat> excuse me, which it's not. Or they say, well, then why wouldn't miners just immediately take the money and give it to themselves? And the answer is that it has to be, it, the, the process for coming back is very slow and laborious. So you have to declare exactly where you're sending the money in advance. Um, and then you have to wait basically three to six months as as miners upvote or downvote this little thing. So it's it, it's intended to be so difficult it's basically like withdrawing money from Fort Knox or something in the United States uh, or just like something very, very, very slow. And it, and it will be apparent immediately to all sidechain users if it's wrong at any time because you just, as soon as the withdrawal is declared, you just have one little hash and you compare it to some other little hash. And that is, uh, then your computer will be able to warn you. But again, it will only be able to warn you if you run the sidechain node. So there is this kind of, this, there's a kind of an assumption built in that uh, a few people would would uh, would would care, but even this is not a real assumption. So, 
Anyway, let me finish my point, which is that this money is coming back, and you everyone will know immediately because it's just one hash to another hash. Now, someone might say, oh, this hash, you know, in order to figure out if the hash is right, I need to run a full node, or you could run the node in SPV mode. There's lots of different, like, variations on this. But the point is that the speed is is so low and the the that it, it's just kind of almost impossible to believe that any that a miner could like accidentally steal this money it's like it has to be very very intentional and this is a very slow thing that it's very easy for humans to sort of check up on and make sure is correct and then if it's not correct they can just kind of right click and UASF and then if the miner ever tries to follow through after the long period and actually steal the money then they can just say I reject that and of course uh, but you see there's a kind of um, there's a there's a lot of other layers to this which is that if we need the freedom to experiment with terrible ideas that have it so that we can't no one can figure out what's going on on the side chain at which point the miners might as well take the money and so that is a desirable thing and we also need in the ability to kind of clean out uh, side chains that are are kind of not uh, not worth it. So it's kind of like you you have the freedom to visit like a bad web page on the internet. Um, so you don't want it's there's a kind of a shades of gray aspect to it where you want you don't want there to be like s some website on the internet that just disables the internet itself. So you don't want to visit a website that will shut off your internet connection. So you reach a contradiction there. But you also don't want anyone to, like kind of curating the list of possible websites for you to visit because you don't necessarily even know yourself which, which you do want to, to visit. So the security model is, is different, but I think if you assume that miners are selfish and that they want, the price of, they want to earn the most money in mining reward, the sidechain gives the miners transaction fees and also by giving new abilities to the Bitcoin coin, they make their own, the 12.5 that they currently earn every 10 minutes, they make that uh, have a, a higher purchasing power and it's a more valuable token for them. And they, that is what drives their incentives more than anything because they, that hits them completely. They, they have to pay out in, to buy electricity, they have to spend fiat. And so they're buying like Bitcoin call options basically in effect and they, they really want Bitcoin's price uh, to go up and to not to go down. See, that's the other thing is if miners allow, you know, sidechain theft or they, the sidechain ecosystem doesn't work out, then the price of Bitcoin may go down um, in that world. So it's, there's a lot of, it's sort of like, it is a little bit different, but it, it's just kind of like, Again, I do think it's similar to original Bitcoin where it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe some, why, why would the miners mine on the longest chain if they can make more money by just mining on a chain uh, by themselves or if they would get together with their friends and double spend or something. And, you know, uh, I, I, uh, and I'm not asking anyone to really believe in it either. I think people should try it out and watch other people try it out and just see if it works. It may, it may not work, but I, I think, you know, I don't think people really appreciate what it would take for a theft to take place. It would take 51% of the hash rate and it would take, for 51%, it would take the whole six months because it's, it would be, if you have 100%, it would take three months, but it would take a long time and it would be obvious to everyone and it'd be plenty of time to like decide, you know, what to do about it, if anything, and this cannot be spammed. Like you can only do this once per side chain. This would depend yeah. on the specific security model of that side chain. Well, be yeah, I have uh, what I have. I have what I have in mind, uh, but anyone could change it to to do anything else. I, I I kind of hope that everyone would do a similar thing so that the side chains are maximally kind of intercomparable with each other, so that an attack on one side chain would be construed as an attack on on, on all of them which I think would make it a bigger disincentive to... That would, um, that would limit experimentation. If, if no, uh, only in the... Because the gate, the gate coming back, I don't intend anyone to really even use. In fact, the people who use it may all be miners themselves. Because you have, you have in one direction, it's super simple and very uh, infinitely secure, just as secure as any other transaction. So in the one direction, there are no problems whatsoever. And then... Um, you have the atomic swaps, and you even have Lightning Network, which is identical across all side chains and altcoins. So, um, so you have these atomic swaps that you can easily. You could have someone 
move 100,000 Bitcoin over and then buy and sell them with other people in exchange for on-chain on -chain Bitcoin and with the normal security assumptions of that just the node is working and that the network is on, then you still get everything. And then if people want to sell, they can, um, they can sell for like 99 cents on the dollar to like these kind of investment banker types who will collect all the money and then slowly walk it over during these, these slow withdrawals. So I don't anticipate anyone even really uh, using the withdrawal part. It's just to establish the, the peg's existence beyond any, the, you know, the... Um, and people would potentially stay in the side chain. Yeah, I think, well, it could go in a couple ways uh, if people will stay in the side chain or, or leave. Um, I would imagine some people, if people want to leave, my point is there should be a, a liquid market for these atomic swaps for them to leave because anyone can uh, make a, a tiny investment return. Uh, yes, and but some people may, there may be specialists who, who go over to uh, a side chain and then they offer services or they create some kind of um, uh, payment channel like thing and so you can use the su the service of the side chain just by kind of going through it even if none of your uh, Bitcoin are over there um, or and so those people if there's not enough Bitcoin on some side chain people might deposit some and then do that and charge higher fee and get some kind of return that way so so one of the problems uh, that I see with uh, side chains and also state channels is that it does add complexity to the user experience is that this is adding steps you know to this and I think this also depends on your view on scaling but I mean I think that we can scale on chain or at least keep up with demand so in that sense I s think that Bitcoin needs to compete with systems that can you know fulfill a lot of these functions simply on chain which is a better user experience and can also be very cheap um, you know, and, and in that sense, I don't see, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I see a lot of use cases where side chains and state channels are actually great, re really very useful for specific use cases, but this definitely does not cover uh, all use cases. Uh, and I think user experience here is very important. And one of the advantages of uh, cryptocurrency um, is that a blockchain represents a type of uh, neutral platform that you know, everyone around the world can do business with. And if we start to set up these, these interconnections and, and interrelationships, then we, we could face a lot of the same problems that we have in current legacy systems. Currently, legacy systems, technologically, they could work very well. But the reason they don't is, is mainly due to politics and you know, organizations not wanting to work together, not wanting to trust each other. And now that we have a blockchain, this neutral platform that allows everyone very easily to transact and to communicate and not to require trust. But once we start stacking layers on top of that, we could start seeing problems of these systems connecting to each other again while also worsening the user experience. Um, Lightning actually being a great example of that where you know you need to you need to load into a hub and then these hubs might not want to connect with each other for different political reasons. In many ways replicating the problems that we have in uh, current financial systems. But of course there's does depend on your view on scaling. I'm personally, I think we can scale on chain and therefore it'd be hard to compete with that. But obviously if I'm wrong about that, then uh, side chains and state channels are obviously the way to go. Yeah, well, I think, uh, yeah, you said a lot of things there, but I think um, one is that the large block side chain, if you just run large block side chain and then you, by, as I explained earlier, you'd have to run the tiny block um, main chain in this setup. But yeah, once you have that, then it's really no different from having um, a, just a large blockchain in general. You just have everyone using, you know, just Roger Veer is giving away money on that chain, and then he gives people that uh, mobile app, and then it's, it's basically the same user experience. So I think the sidechain user experience is the same if, if you're not moving around, as and it would be on one large blockchain, large block uh, blockchain, so it would be the same. But in terms of a UI perspective, I don't quite see that working because to have a wallet, let's say, and uh, you have Bitcoins in that wallet and that Bitcoin exists in a sidechain, it would be very confusing to users to label that as Bitcoin because you cannot transact directly to another Bitcoin address, which again, which is the kind of complexity that I'm talking about that, that creates those problems. Uh, yes, yeah, I think you, well, you're right about that, but you could 
send directly to another address within this thing. So you'd call it, it you could call the side chain like a giga chain or something. And it would have a giant, it would have gigabyte blocks or something. And then, but everyone would just, you know, Roger Veer would just tell everyone to, in this hypothetical, you know, I'm sort of speaking for fun here, but he would just tell everyone to use that app or the family of apps that uses that system. And then it would be the it would be the same. I mean, it's no different, I think, from the situation it is with altcoins today, where it's like within the altcoin, there may be many apps or one or two um, that ha interface with the user, and the moving m among different altcoins is difficult. But you know, it used to be impossible, and and now it's it's much easier than it was before. I, like I'm kind of shocked, honestly. At how, I mean, Shapeshift is very easy to use. A lot of the payment processors now integrate with with many uh, different coins. You know, you can have one where it's like, oh, we take Bitcoin, Litecoin, Monero, Bitcoin Cash, etc. So, uh, so I, I don't I don't think it would be uh, that different. Um, I do agree that the user experience is uh, important, though. Um, but yeah, I think these. These things are hard to say. I mean, you say like if um, you know, it depends on your belief if if Bitcoin can can scale on chain. Um, but again, like the the Hayekian view that I like is that you you set in the very much the Nassim Taleb view, which is that you try to set up world the world so that it doesn't depend on whether or not you know something because knowing things is just too difficult. And so you just say, well, you know, the side chains. It's like we try it. we try it. You have the side chain, large block side chain. You turn it on and then, oh, like, oh, that didn't work. But then you figure out why it didn't work. Oh, maybe it's easy to fix or maybe it, maybe it just does work. You know, maybe there are no problems at all. Or maybe I presented it scaling three. I was like, maybe the fact that you just have b both of them, it's like a Martin Bailey defense where you know, people would build this kind of tower or castle, like on a hill, and then they would have like a kind of other thing where they would mostly hang out, like in a field. And that's where they really wanted to be. No one wanted to be in the tower. This is like in whatever, the 500 AD mm -hmm. era. And you would you'd want to hang out in the large block place where the fees are cheap. But then if someone tries to attack all of the nodes, then you just retreat to the tower and shoot with giant longbows at these people, you know, until they leave you alone. Uh, and then they leave and then you go back out. And so this is yeah. kind of like a strategic synergy between the two. I'm not sure if that's a desirable situation to be in if uh, we have better alternatives. Well, I don't know. What do you mean by that? Oh, I mean, in your analogy of uh, having to retreat to the tower and shoot down the people in the field, I mean, all of that could be avoided. Right, you know, I understand. Yes, I understand. But then, you know, like if, like, you know, right. But, it, but I think for a lot of people, like, and, you know, I think, I think the design, if, if Bitcoin were to really succeed in, in terms of the vision of core, like transaction fees would have to become very high. I think at current scale, you know, more than $100 per transaction. And I think that, that that creates a type of inequity where not everyone can afford to move into the tower. And even furthermore, not everyone can fit in the tower. I mean, I, I believe for everyone to do a single transaction on Bitcoin, uh, it would take a century for the entire world to do one transaction. So I don't really see that the gate is big enough to save those people. And I think a lot of the plebs are gonna be stuck in the field and shot down. It's quite the analogy here. I, 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 well, that's not really what I mean is that uh, that's, that's close. But, but by staying in the tower, I mean that Bitcoin itself is still alive and everyone's money is just kind of on pause. Mm -hmm. So the large block, I'm imagining all th something that you know, this is the the disaster painted by the core people is that there's only like five nodes and they're all in a data center in China and the Chinese government rolls in and says that you have to like do X, Y, Z or whatever. And so, uh, <laughs> so the Chinese government rolls on in and they say, you can't do this or you can't do that. And then, or just, you have to shut all this off. And so my defense is that instead of the newspaper headline being China destroys Bitcoin completely, Chinese government number one, you know, whatever was so great. Instead, the headline is just Chinese government makes Bitcoin much more expensive to use. Some people find that very annoying, you know, and then the conversation is just about how they are doing something that is directly 
inconvenient, but not even really achieving a, a, a good purpose. And so that's kind of what I mean. So I think to me, that's somewhat of a false dichotomy in that, you know, this idea that we'll only have five nodes that govern the network, that's certainly not something I would advocate for, right? And I don't know whether or not it's accurate or not, but I'm just saying this is the this is, a, sure. this is again this is the Hayekian thing. So it's like, okay, well, if that happened, do we have some plan for that? Then okay, then there you go. There's your plan. So works for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think I think there is a middle ground that can be struck here as well because like something actually I'll introduce an idea here. Something that I always found to be a lot more realistic. Uh, to establish for Bitcoin is if we just simply just established a minimum specification of like, you know, what should be the minimum specification to run a full node? Like realistically, like like today, like you can run a Bitcoin full node for like $5 a month uh, pretty easily. And I think with eight megabyte block sizes, that's $10 a month. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I think I think in that sense, I think, you know, being realistic, if we say, let's establish a minimum specification. So let's say just an average computer with an average connection in the developed world. I don't think we should expect, you know, poor people in the third world to run four nodes. That doesn't necessarily seem to be the correct priority here. I'm more happy to enable SPV wallets for, uh, you know, the, the disenfranchise of this world. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that that question is linked to the other question, which is the which is how people feel about SPV. <laughs> and again, I, I kind of feel very fine with it. So, oh, this is actually very interesting. So first of all, I wrote a, a cool blog post that a lot of people liked. Uh, it's very long in my characteristic style on truthcoin.info, but it's called Measuring Decentralization. And I concluded that the best, this word is very vague. And I was like, what does this word mean? You know, Because that was another point of contention. And I was like, well, this is not going to get anywhere if no one has a definition for this word. So I said, let's define it as the cost of your option just to create a new full node and then start using it. Mm -hmm. So it's basically what you're saying. Um, and so that's, so we should have some, if we care about decentralization, we should be able to define it and measure it and people should really care about the measurements and the definitions. Very suspiciously, many people do not. They say they care about def de de decentralization, but then it's like, uh, it's like saying you care about I don't know uh, chemistry, but you don't keep track of elements, or you don't—you never build a microscope, or from in biology or something. So this, so that aspect is is very interesting. But then the SPV aspect is also interesting because people say, well, um, we never built these fraud proofs. Uh, but I actually also did a very <laughs> recent blog post about that, which is much very very long and very complicated about. Uh, how I think w you might be able to do these fraud proofs that no one has been able to disagree with uh, yet. But uh, just to your point, at the at the bottom, I'm like, I don't know if anyone really even needs this because seriously, like, when's the last time that you know it's there's this asym this asymmetry for those of you who don't know in SPV mode where almost all of the work, 99.99 percent of the miners' effort goes into this thing that you can check in like two seconds and then validating the block is this much longer task and uh, you know that's a very clever I find that to be a very clever design and a very good asymm asymmetry and it's like would if miners want to get paid they should run the node and what's what's the percentage of the node cost relative to the other capex that they put in you know wouldn't they just and then the other thing on top of that is that um, the the there's a total there's a dichotomy between miners is a word that describes actually a couple of different people but mainly two groups, the hashers who are just cranking out the SHA-256, but then there's also like these pool operators that kind of decide what to do and then they just pass a tiny amount of information, you know, whatever it is like 200 kilobytes or something or not it just yeah and so it's it's like those are the people who need to run one node, you know, in exchange for being the pool operator and having a brand of, of uh, that to try to attract these, these hashers. And it's an environment that is, in, you know, it's like textbook perfect competition that anyone can just show up and there's no barriers to entry for this. So you show up and establish a brand, you'll be raking it in and you want to defend that brand that you 
don't miscalculate the block and invalidate all the miners' uh, payments. But then people say, oh, how will we ever know? Like, why would the payments ever be invalidated if no one is checking? And then you say, well, some people will check. And then it becomes kind of a crazy thing. I'd like to touch on that, actually. And I think, I think you, you defined as hashes and pools. I think I, I'm using the definition miners and pools, but it's the same thing, just a semantic difference there. But I think this is, this is something that a lot of people forget because there's a lot of talk about if we increase the block size, it increases mining centralization. And I, I, that is categorically wrong. <laughs> The sense in which people mean that, yeah. that ship has sailed a very yeah. long time ago. And there was like one mempool shared by like 70% of the miners as of like early 2014 or something like that. So, yeah. so that's a, that ship has completely sailed. But in a, in a good sense, the Sergio Damon Lerner was the, one of the earliest to point this out and no one would, would really listen. Uh, and this ties into all kinds of other crazy things. But, but there was this phenomenon of, of block orphaning Everyone should, uh, it's very instructive and fun. If you go to blockchain.info charts, which are very fun, but you can check out the orphaned blocks. You see as block got bigger, there, were, there was suddenly this problem of the blocks being orphaned. And that, it's hard to very quickly explain what's going on there, but the miners don't like orphan blocks because they mined a valid block, but then they lose all their money for it. So they, because they happen to be found coincidentally at the same time as someone else and just no one checked. So this started to be a big problem, but then eventually you reach a point where a uh, block size continues to increase, but then this problem just basically just completely goes, falls off a cliff and goes away. And then now no, no blocks are really orphaned uh, almost ever. And... That is because of this phenomenon of SPV and spy mining, where all of the miners are actually s plugged into each other's pools, and they will, as soon as someone finds a new header and clicks the new miners over to it, everyone will click over to it immediately without, without explicit, before they explicitly check on it. But they do implicitly check in the fact that they are um, still working on, yeah, they do implicitly check in the fact that they, they assume that since these other miners have been driven to uh, you know, the, the other pool administrator has decided that they are going to start working on this. Mm -hmm. That is a kind of indirect evidence that you should at least work on it until you have checked for yourself, which is like 30 or 40 seconds. So that this problem doesn't really happen anymore. But yeah, the, the mining centralization is another thing that it, unlike decentralization, which I tried to define, Basically, no one has risen to the challenge and defined minor centralization in a in an acceptable way to me, other than this bo very boring sense in in that pe miners like talking to each other or something like that. Oh, if I'll just explain that a bit more, I think that um, like the reality of Bitcoin today is that there's uh, twenty to forty pools, and I and I don't think that's going to change because it's simply just how variance works. Now, considering the scale of mining, these pools can you know afford to run four nodes essentially, and and you know exactly, and this is yeah exactly. Exactly, and you know, and this is why, like, as a miner, like I, I run some miners from home. It doesn't matter if they're one megabyte blocks or one gigabyte blocks. As a home miner, you're actually not affected by uh, by this, and that's that's a exactly, and yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so I think this is this has been a very uh, false narrative, I suppose, that's been going around. But uh, node centralization, obviously, is a different issue entirely. Um, but but I would I would actually just uh, hop back actually just just tie back to what you're saying about side chains and you know one of the gripes maybe I have with Bitcoin now is that um, you know it, it's failing to adopt you know good changes in the code and and you know for instance just changing a one to a two I think would have been an acceptable compromise and introducing your concept of side chains I think would have been a very amazing experiment to see you know and, and this is something that maybe shows flaws in the way that bitcoin itself is being governed you know from a github you know currently and the kind of governance philosophy around that yeah, well maybe but you know i think for i think a different thing okay all right cool uh but yeah i think a bigger thing is just the lack of interest because you know i've been working on and tinkering with the, the sidechains mm -hmm. technology and code over time so it's been improving and so then it's even still not even the test net but i do find it a, 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 i find a weird apathy that i can't ex can't really fully explain that i have a lot of theories but yeah. i suspect um if you went to something like ethereum or uh, bitcoin cash that'd be far more welcoming to your ideas yeah. <laughs> well it's been an absolute um
That's cool. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you here and uh, really enjoy your work. And thank you. Thank <laughs> you.